Welcome, everybody. I am Sam Ocean. I have worked with some of the biggest seven-figure creators in the online education space, been doing it for about nine years now. I help them scale revenue, and I do that with uh, offers, marketing, and just helping them be different. So I host a space on X once a week. I share everything I've learned and am currently learning, and I like to document my journey and build in public. That way, you can see that I'm doing this stuff for myself. Um, and one of my side goals is I'm turning myself into my own biggest case study. So that way I can demonstrate some of the things we talk about here on this space for uh, you to have more trust to follow that. In today's space, we are talking about the number one question that I get over DMs and phone calls. And it's not just, you know, since my year being here on X, this is what this is the question that's been going around for a decade now, which is all related to asking, what business should I start? This is a paralyzing question for a lot of people because we are scared of wasting time, wasting money, wasting energy, doing the wrong thing. So back when I started this game, I remember I, I bought tons of courses. Um, I've joined tons of programs over the years. I've spent over a hundred thousand dollars into other people's pockets just to learn from them and early on a lot of it was man i just want to pay you money and please just tell me which direction i should go I, i'll go do it i'll do whatever it takes i just want to make sure i'm going in a good direction so i started as a copywriter and i was like should i be the sales page guy should i be the email guy should i be the lead magnet guy should i write for this market should i write for that market should i do one-off projects should i do monthly retainers should i even do copywriting should I be a one person business? Should I be a agency? The questions were just the weight of trying to answer these was a burden. So it took me years to figure out, but I finally did. And I did it when I discovered one thing, which is strategy. Okay. Learning the art and the science, whatever you want to call it, of strategy is what allowed me to find these answers uh, to some of the hardest questions. And so I want to share the simple, the three steps that I uh, view strategy from and the framework that I use to create strategy. Now, before we dive into that, it's important to know what strategy is not. Okay. We all hear the word and how important it is, but I see a lot of people who truly don't understand the concept of strategy. We're going to go a little bit deeper today. It is a word that's thrown around and it's misused in the wrong context. So for example, a content calendar is not a strategy. Even an offer is not a strategy. Posting videos is not a strategy. Networking is not a strategy. All of those are just tools. All of those are just tactics. They're specific things you do to create a result, but none of them in and of themselves are a strategy. A strategy is simply this. It is creating a plan to reach a goal. That's it. A strategy is a roadmap that takes you from point A to point B in the most efficient way possible. So I could summarize this into one of my favorite quotes by a mentor, a previous client, Jay Abraham. He said, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, but what if you're going in the wrong direction? It's almost like successfully climbing a mountain, but you climb the wrong mountain. So I want to share a story I don't talk about often about when I climbed the wrong mountain. So it's back in 2017. I fly to Cancun, Mexico. I chase an ex-girlfriend down there to try and win her back. You know, one of those love stories. And I wasn't making much money. So I booked this cheap Airbnb in the center of the city. Uh, it's ugly. It doesn't look good. But I take a 30-minute bus ride to the beach every day. And I just fall in love with the culture. I just fall in love with Mexico. For anyone here who knows, I've been in Mexico for the last five years because of this moment. Now, I made it a dream to come back, but with way more money. And that's exactly what I did. So around 2020, um, I'm touching down in Cancun again, but not in some you know shitty Airbnb. I'm checking in to a, uh, a hotel on the beach. It is the ninth floor with a balcony overlooking the water. And it takes me two minutes to walk from, from my hotel down to the beach. And I'm booked for two months. It was straight. It was literally straight out of my vision board. I worked my way up to around $27,000 a month over that three years, right? It was with a, hand, a small handful of clients and it was just me, a team of one. So it was 100% profit. After four weeks of this trip, I go onto the balcony, look over the water. I thought I would be filled with gratitude, but instead I realized I hated it all. I was on the verge of burnout. I was working 10 hours a day, 
literally seven days a week, morning to evening, even Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, my girlfriend that I bring with me at the time, she would go down to the beach by herself because I was just stuck on back to back Zoom calls, tight deadlines. I would skip on going out dancing. It, I was just too exhausted for it. I had this epic dream, but it felt like it was on the other side of this unbreakable glass window. One of those things where it was so close, but so far. And so even though I was earning multiple five figures a month, it was way too much stress to deal with. All I wanted to do was burn it down. That is when I learned today's lesson, which is achieving more can actually bring us further away from what we truly want. Humans have this mindset where we just want more, more, more. We bias more things, more engagement, more followers, more leads, more customers, more sales, more revenue. More revenue actually led me further away from my goals and what I truly wanted. Another example is I've worked in a lot of big companies and I've, uh, I've, I've been able to brush shoulders with a lot of big founders. I once overheard a conversation between a founder doing $10 million a year uh, who had 80 employees and he was talking to a copywriter doing six figures a year and that copywriter had zero employees. The founder looks at the copywriter and says, I'm envious of you because although I have money, you have freedom. And then he ran off to his next like 10 meetings for the day, right? Gary Vaynerchuk talks about this too. And I'm pretty sure Kiri posted about this maybe in the last couple of weeks, which is it's, he says, it's not about how much money you make, but it's about how you make your money. So on that balcony, I realized having more clients and income didn't make me happier or more successful. I needed to focus more on how I made my money to begin with, rather than stressing about what business I need to run to make my money. So over the next 30 days, I fire 80% of my clients, but it doesn't drop my income by 80%. It only drops it by half. So I go down to about 14K a month. But this time I go from 80 hours a week down to 10 to 15 hours a week, literally two to three hours a day. I can take weekends completely off. It was probably the most beautiful window of my life. And man, do sometimes do I think about that uh, moment often. That experience is what taught me that there is no such thing as the best business to start. There's no best business, no best niche, no best offer, no best audience. The word best is almost a, a mental scam because Everything works. Every business, every funnel, every offer, it all works. You just have to build it in a way that works for you. So I ran a business that I hated, but 30 days later, I changed one little thing and I suddenly loved that same business. That business, which used to be the wrong business, suddenly became the right business. And I didn't have to change anything. Now, it's not about what business you choose. It's about how you build the business that you choose. So to me, it begs a real question, which is regardless of what you choose, how do you build something that brings you closer to what actually matters to you? That's the question here. And that is why strategy is important. Strategy allows you to do that. Strategy allows you to build things in the right way so you can turn something into the right choice. So uh, we're about to dive into that. And I look at strategy very simple. I just have three steps that I do. This is not how other people do it. This is just what I've found to work for me. So it's an approach I currently use for myself. Um, I want you guys to be the first ones to know about it. It's my way of thanking you, following me, trusting me. I'll never forget the people who helped me at the beginning of my journey who didn't ask for anything returned. So I just want to do the same thing for you here on this space. Now I see we got Brian's hand up. Brian, I'll be taking questions maybe in like 15 minutes. Let me bring, let me get Greg up to the speaker slot. I see Sebastian, Aiden. I'm excited for our space on Friday. Elmo, it's been awesome to see you start building in public. Carlo, always a pleasure chatting with you. Francesca, Andrew, Paul, Marjorie, awesome to have you back. Ashana, the man who's got the million subscriber play button. Um, yeah, so many people here. Man, thank you all for showing up. This is amazing. Oh, beautiful. I'm just scrolling. I saw I saw at the beginning, uh, Nikki, I appreciate you for being one of the first ones here. I'm excited to connect with you in the chat. So what we're going to do is um, for anyone who just joined, this is what I call strategy decoded three steps to choosing the right business path for you. The number one question we're all asking is what business should I start? I spent eight years asking this myself, and I finally found the answer when I learned about strategy. So that's what we're going to do. So uh, with that, with that said, 
we are going to dive in now. Strategy 101. What does it look like? Strategy is going from point A to point B in the most efficient way possible. My favorite metaphor for explaining this is Google Maps. Google Maps is literally a perfect example because you want to go somewhere, so you pull out your phone, open Google Maps, and you type in your end destination. Google Maps then draws a blue line from where you are to wherever you want to go, and it will give you directions every step of the way. If you if you take a wrong turn, that's okay because Google Maps will find a new route for you. Strategy is no different than this. A good strategy will tell you where to go and it will guide you back on track if you start to get lost. Okay, so this brings us to step one, which is where do you want to go? You cannot choose a business or even begin to build a strategy until you know what the goals are, until you know what the end destination is. And I do mean this in the biggest sense of the word, right? Uh, I'm not going to stay in kind of woo-woo, inspirational, motivational land, but it is asking yourself, if money were not an issue, what would you do? Okay, if money were not an issue, what would you do? But check this out. You want to choose a business that brings you as close as possible to that vision, and then you want to build that business to bring you even closer, okay? This is the goal here. Whatever you want in life, if money were not an issue, now we come to reality and realize, yes, we do need to work for money. We do need to work for these things. Choose a business that brings you somewhat close to that vision. And then what's more important is build that business in a way that brings you right next to that vision. That's the key here less emphasis on what business you choose, much more emphasis on how you build that. So um, this doesn't work if you don't know what you want in life, right? So it's a scene from Alice in Wonderland, one of my favorites, the only ones that I remember, which is Alice asks the cat, hey, which way should I go? The cat's like, it depends on where you want to go. And Alice says, I don't know where I want to go. And the cat says, then it doesn't matter, right? So imagine using Google Maps, but you never entered the end destination that is what most people are doing when they ask this question they are somewhat losing track of what their end destination is this is going to anchor us and give us that north star so i look at this in two ways okay there are two there are two ways to answer this question one there are things you can cross off a bucket list right things you can do once things you can do for the first time it's something like buying a house or uh, learning how to speak a language fluently for a weekend. It's retiring your parents, sending your kids to the best college, stuff like that, okay? Things you want to buy, this external kind of, you know, pleasures that we can have in life, even if it's buying a Lambo, all of that's fine, okay? And then you go internal. It's things you just want to do every day, things you want to feel every day. These are the more intangibles, like if you want to create art, if you want to read, if you want to eat healthy, if you want to be healthy, if you just want to feel connected to people and hang out with friends, um, you just do those over and over and over. And there's not really an end to those where if you buy a house, it's like it's over. If you retire your parents, that's done. So think about what you want in those two aspects. Okay. In my own life, if money were not an issue, I'd be traveling three to four months out of the year. I'd eat out at amazing restaurants like five nights a week. I'd be drinking tequila with my friends and dancing salsa all the time. That's like my ideal lifestyle. And so some things I want to do is buy some passports. I want to learn to speak some languages. I want to uh, get a couple houses, right? These are my ambitious dreams. And I just want to be meeting new people every day. So, you know, this is open looping to a future step. I need to build a business and I need to build it in a way that brings me closer to these things. Because if it does not, I'm going to look on my metaphorical balcony and realize I hate this and the money's not going to matter. Okay. So that's, that's why I mentioned this is step one. Okay. If you, for example, if one of your things is you just want to watch your kids grow up and you never want to miss a single moment, like they're playing soccer, you don't want to miss a soccer game. <clears throat> then you shouldn't do anything that causes you to miss a soccer game. If a client call comes up, if someone wants to do something during that time or you have a project you need to work overtime, it's like you say no to the call, you push the project because if you take it, it's now suddenly taking you further away from what you want. So when you find out what you want, it almost makes these decisions for us and it tells us, okay, I can't start that business because I'll be working 50 hours a week. I'm not gonna build it this way because then I have to work on Saturdays and I miss my kid's soccer game. That's how you wanna approach this. Step one, determine where you wanna go. Step two is overlooked. It's all about where are you right now, okay? 
Google Maps only works because you give it two points, where you want to go and where you currently are, and then it draws the line between the two. So where you currently are, are your resources. How much time do you have? How much money do you have? How much focus do you have? You can even go deeper and be like, what kind of skills do you have right now? What, what kind of network do you have access to? What are your talents? This is taking stock of where you're currently at. A lot of people go wrong with shiny object syndrome and copying what other people do around this step. The reason you can't just copy someone else and what they're doing is because, and expect the same results, is because that person is an entirely different situation than you. A very clear unicorn example. It's why you can't just look at billion dollar companies and try to reverse engineer what they're doing today and start to apply that in your business. Because what they are doing at the billion dollar level is not what they were doing at the $100,000 level, right? And so what you have to do is you have to look at someone and say, how did they get there in the first place? You have to backtrack and then you find someone who was in a similar situation as you and then you can copy those actions. So there's an order of steps. If you get the order of steps wrong, you won't make any progress. So another example, you, can, if, uh, you can't work hard for eight hours a day if you can only focus for one hour a day. So you don't want to create a strategy that requires you to be working 40 hours a week if you can really only give it, you know, five to 10 hours a week, right? And you can't just start working one hour a day from the start if you don't have the leverage in place to do that. You might, you know, maybe you want to only work one hour a day, but you're going to have to work five hours a day at the start so you can build the leverage to eventually get to the point where you're working one hour a day. This is what strategy starts to reveal to us. My last point is to, to make it more specific for anyone listening. You can break this up into three categories. This is how I do it. You're either zero to one, you're either one to 10, or you're either 10 to 100, okay? Zero to one phase is where most people are at. That's if you have yet to have your first big financial breakthrough, whatever that means to you, you'll typically know if you've been through that or not. And this is if you're still figuring things out. If you're in this stage, your goal is to take action, focus on marketing and sales, and not worry about being perfect, okay? Take action, get messy, cause chaos. One of my favorite quotes is, success is cooked in a dirty kitchen. Uh, you don't need to worry about being perfectly organized, okay? This is what's going to create the momentum to bring you into the next level. This could be anywhere from $5,000 a month up to $20,000 a month. That's roughly the zero to one range. So if you're not kind of in that range yet, ju just go, go move and create a mess. And that is going to get you up to where you want to be. That brings you into the one to 10 stage. Okay. Now you can start to focus on slowing down a bit. You can get more focused. Um, you can build more systems. Zero to one is finding what works for you. And then one to 10 is doubling down on what works. Um, and then 10 to, 10 to 100, very few people are there, but this is about replacing yourself, scaling. That's for a different call. So in this step, you need to be very honest and real with yourself and say, okay, here is who I am today. Here is what I have. I need to build my strategy with where I'm at and the distance between where I want to go, maybe shorter or longer, okay? This is the most exciting step, step three. Once you have your two endpoints, you need to ask, what path do you want to take, okay? Once you have these points, you choose your path. Google Map does this cool thing where it gives you options. You can walk, you can take a car, you can ride a bike. It dep you, you can choose the option, okay? Depending on which one you select, it will then give you the path that's best for you. So when people ask, what's the best business to start? This is what they're really asking. They're almost asking, which is the best path to take? As you can see, it just depends on where you're at and where you want to go. All paths might go a different direction, but they'll eventually end up at the same destination. There is no right answer here. You simply choose the path you prefer. There's no right or wrong. It's all a preference-based decision. And I want to emphasize this, hopefully to free some people of kind of this paralyzing question that you have to get it right. You just have to do what's right for you. So um, when I talk to a client and we talk about strategy, I give them it, this example in one of three ways. We can metaphorically walk to where you want to go. It's free, but it's going to take forever. Or we can take a plane that is expensive, but it's very fast. 
It's going to be the fastest option we have. However, we might experience turbulence and that's going to feel emotionally uncomfortable. So if you can handle that turbulence, we might as well get on the plane, right? Or there's a middle option. We can, we can drive a car. It costs some money, but it's nothing crazy. We don't get there as fast, but it's a lot faster than walking. Plus we can pull over, smell the roses anytime we want. It's a little bit more enjoyable, which path do you prefer? Some people are just hyper ambitious. They're like, let's get on that private jet. Let's just go. I don't care if there's a storm, we're going to make it there as fast as possible. Boom. There's a strategy that emphasizes speed above all else. Other people are like, oh, I'm not in any rush. I just want to enjoy this. Um, let, let's just take our time. Cool. We might walk or we might take a car. I think that's where, that's where, and it's okay to switch between the two. If you, if you hop on a plane, AKA you create a strategy where you're working eight hours a day, you don't have to do that forever. You can do that for the first few months and then you can start to slow down, which I think is the path most people probably should be taking just from uh, how I've talked to most of them. So in a business context, you can build an audience. That is free, it is powerful, but it takes a long time to get that compounding effect. You can skip an audience and you can just go straight to running ads. It's fast, it literally starts today, but you can waste a lot of money if it's not done right, right? You can build a $50 course, you can build a $5,000 service, you can grow on X or you can grow on YouTube, you can start your own business, or you can work for someone else. You can be number one in your own business or you can go be number two in someone else's business. Every option literally works. Every option has been proven to work. There is someone doing each option today successfully right now. The question is, which option do you want to take for yourself? And that fully depends on where you want to go and where you currently are. Then you can just decide how you want to do it. Okay. So if you want enough money just to pay the bills, to not stress, to only work for three to four hours a day, then it could be as simple as just go be a, just go get a couple clients, right? Go be a copywriter, go be a marketer, go do one of these things. Um, and then you're good, right? You don't need to go any further than that. If you want the same thing, but you only want to work one hour a day, if you just want just enough money to pay the bills, but you want to work one hour a day, you might need a different strategy because clients are going to expect you to work more than that uh, in most cases. So now you might need to start building an audience so you can kind of sell a digital product on the side to supplement the income. But if you're someone who's more like me, you want to be more lavish, you want to travel, you want to go big, then you might need to do something big. You might need to start an agency. You might need to focus on building a huge audience. You might need to raise your prices up to $10,000 and start to sell some B2B offers to some uh, people with big pockets like uh, Kiri does here, right? This is what I prefer to do. Um, if you want, you know, what you want in life will determine the right business for you. So for me, I want to travel. I want to create. I actually want to enjoy things, but I also never want to worry about money also I'd like to buy some things. So I have a lot of desires. And because I have so many desires, it starts to remove the options that are good for me, right? I no longer can just go get a couple clients and call it good because then it will take me like 200 years to make the money I want to go live the life that I want. So I need to, I need to go a little bit bigger, for example. Um, this is why I'm creating an audience so I can build that leverage. And it's why I started nine months ago and behind the scenes, I'm starting to do business to business stuff so I can sell more expensive prices to people with deeper pockets, but I won't need 50 clients to hit my goal because 50 clients means I'm going to be working like eight hours a day. If I don't build it right, you see what I mean? So my one piece of advice is. If you haven't had the first financial breakthrough yet, don't be afraid to focus on money. It's okay to make money your priority. A lot of my successful mentors and friends, they actually emphasize your first business should focus on cash flow. Okay. Your first business should focus on getting cash into your pocket. Um, because with that cash, you can then feel more secure and you now have a foundation to go take the next step or to go do the next thing or to go even further and you can do it a lot faster because cash is a very valuable resource and we shouldn't be ashamed to want to go chase that. Um, don't chase more money at the expense of working more than you want to though, okay? When I say prioritize cash flow, it means maybe instead of working, you know, you know, five hours a day, you work six hours a day. Instead of three hours a day, you work three to five, right? But don't go overboard like I did. Don't start working 12 hours a day, even though I was making uh, around $27,000 a month, right? That was 80 hours a week. I would have been much more successful if I just did 
$10,000 a month at 15 hours a week. Okay. That is much more optimal for someone like myself at that time. So we're about to wrap it up here. Um, I just want to give a couple more examples. I have a mentor who loves to learn from smart people. That's what he wants to do in life. He doesn't care about buying houses. He doesn't care about Lambos. All he cares about is just hanging with smart people and learning from them. So he built his business around that. What he does is he finds smart people. And I mean, people who innovate, people who are on the cusp of like creating new things that society uses. He then goes and partners with them. He moves to that person's city so he can be next to them every day. And then he helps the smart person take their ideas to the world. And he takes a piece of the profit. He doesn't care about the profit. He cares about the proximity to the people he wants to learn from. And now he's the happiest person I know. I have a buddy who hates social media and he hates doing work. Okay. He's one of those, you know, work smarter, not harder. You know, I'm lazy. I don't want to do anything type of people, but he loves networking and he loves drinking. Okay. So he attends every event he can and he buys people's drinks and then he's just charismatic and he woos them up and gets business cards. And then he closes deals on behalf of other people and then just takes a small cut. That's his business. He didn't do that business because he saw someone else doing it. He did that business because it's bringing him closer to what he wants to do in life. For me, early on, I worked with two high paying clients and that was perfect at the time, but I want more now. Okay. So I want to build an audience while still working with a small handful of uh, clients and partners, but ones who are much higher leverage. Okay. Since I love to write, since I love to create, I'm much more of a creator than I am an entrepreneur. It is easier for me to commit to building something, uh, something on X rather than some other platform, right? This is the platform for me. And so whatever I build is going to allow me to keep traveling, keep earning and keep writing, but not have to write to gain followers or gain audience just to write for the creativity and love of it, which is why I love building in public so much. That's literally just a creative outlet for me. And it happens to bring me closer to my goals. So some of my final thoughts are, I realize this this year. At the end of the day, we ask this question and what stops us is we want a guarantee. What's the best offer? What's the best business? What's the best niche? Whatever comes after that, we want to be guaranteed that it is the right thing to do, right? This desire stops us from choosing because the only guarantee is there are no guarantees. When you understand this, it will unlock you because it will free you from the need to be perfect. We all play by these same rules, even billionaires, right? A billionaire doesn't know if their next idea is going to work or not. They don't know if what they're doing is the best thing. A lot of the most successful people here are still unsure about their next steps, which means you shouldn't be obsessed with trying to flip a coin and having it land heads. What you should be obsessed about is flipping the coin over and over and over. And if it lands heads, awesome. If it lands tails, we flip again, okay? So what I would say is this, go take your top two to three ideas that you're most excited about. If you want an anchor to choose what to do next, choose an idea you're excited to do. I love this quote. I love this term. I think excitement is the best signal in our body that guides us towards where we need to be going, especially in business. Ancient texts will say excitement is enthusiasm and enthusiasm is like being breathed upon by the gods. I freaking love that quote. This is how I uh, live my life. Take your top two to three most exciting ideas. Give yourself 30 to 60 days each on those ideas and go all in on one idea at a time for about 30 to 60 days and then see what happens, see the results, see if it got a lot of leads, if it got clients, see if it was hard, see if it was fun, see if it was easy. After three to six months, you will have answers to your question. To say, what business should I start? That answer exists three to six months from now if you just allow yourself to go test and experiment with each idea you have. And you don't have to worry about committing to any single one business right now. This is just my philosophy. You may have a 10-year vision, but you don't have to be running the same business for 10 years. The 10-year vision is what direction you're going. And you might have multiple businesses, multiple steps, as long as you're going in the same direction and getting closer to what you actually want. So at the end of the day, you can't win a race you don't want to be in. And that's what I hope you get out of this uh, space today. So I am done. I'm going to start to take some questions. So I see uh, we already got some speakers up here. So you guys get first dibs. I see some others are starting to request. 
if you want to start to come up, um, just hit the request button. I'll bring you up. We got a lot of time to, you know, talk about things, whether you have anything to ask about this space or you want to share something, because I know there's uh, a lot of people who might have some opinions and some philosophies of their own. It would be awesome to hear these. And so just to kind of for anyone who started to tune in towards the middle of this you know, it's it's not about what business you start. Every business works. Every offer works. It's more about how you build that business and uh, f finding something that kind of comes natural and exciting to you. You don't want to focus on more, more followers, more clients, more money. Don't chase more engagement. What you want to do is focus on getting closer. So take actions that bring you closer to what you actually want. And you do this by focusing on strategy and strategy is just three steps. Step one, where do you want to go? Step two, where are you today? As in right now, as you're listening to the space and then step three, what is the quickest, most efficient path to go between those two points? And then you just start to go. Okay. So usually I do a thing where I offer, you know, if, if you were to retweet this and reshare this with your audience, I would give you something in return because I feel like that's the least I could do. I create these cool little free mini courses for people, but today I don't have one of those. I just appreciate you for being here. That's more than enough for me. Um, I'm just excited to kind of jam and chat with anyone here. If you want to come up one of my favorite parts of the space. And so with that said, um, let's dive in. I'll let Brian or go first. Hey, Sam, what's up? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Awesome. Uh, yeah, thank you for, for hosting this. I have a page full of notes already from, from the bombs that you were dropping here. Uh, I want to shout out real quick some of the guys here that I've been seeing on Spaces lately, like Greg, Sebastian, Kiri, um, Kenny. So shout out to you guys. But uh, Sam, I want to rewind back a little bit and recap to something you said earlier, which some of the people who came later might not have heard. At one point, you said you were on that balcony in Mexico and you had to do an audit of essentially your client profile and determine how how you were going to move forward with your business to to align with the lifestyle that you wanted. So um, I don't want to I want to learn a lot and I want to listen to all you guys. So that I'm going to stop right there and just ask you: Can you walk us through that exercise or whatever you did to kind of how you filtered out, how you ran that audit, and was it strictly based on on client you know most revenue per client? Or, or is it, um, you know, the amount of work? Like, can you just walk us through what you did to audit your, your client profile on that balcony? Brian, yes, I could. Awesome question. Um, so I, I look at a few things and the lenses I look at it through can sometimes change. The number one lens that I start with first is which one am I just the most excited by? Okay. Which, and that is like, which one's more natural? Which, which one's more easy to do? Which one do I just like actually get joy from? So that was number one, and I put a lot of weight on that. Now, also, uh, I'm hoping, I'm crossing my fingers that the ones I'm most excited about are also the ones that like take the least time and pay the most. In this case, uh, that that was true. So when I looked at the clients I had, there was an unequal distribution, okay? I believe unequal distributions exist everywhere. And what I mean by that is the 80-20 rule. So what are the 20% of clients bringing in 80% of the results? I've never not seen that to be the case. I had a clear example of it. I had a very small handful of clients bringing in pretty much most of the dough um, and they were much easier to do. So for me, it was easy to make that decision. At the time, I was a little bit nervous because we always get worried about what we what we call taking a step back, right? I had, I had this level of income and I'm like, ooh, I'm now successful. Although I was working way too hard for it on the path, I was pretty much burnt out already, if I admit it. And um, I needed to let go of it. The letting go process is scary, but I think it's one of the most essential. The, the last thing I'll say on that is my, one of my favorite metaphors or analogies, whatever it's called, is chess, right? This game is not like checkers. You're not just trying to move your pieces forward all the time. It's like chess. You move forward, you move sideways, um, and sometimes you move backwards. And other times you even make the sacrifice play. And so I think a lot of business comes down to when are you willing to make the sacrifice play? Because sometimes that is what wins the game. So this was my sacrifice play and it turned out to be the winning move. And, uh, yeah, I love that. And um, I appreciate that. And, and I appreciate you being able to break down such a complex topic, like, like choosing the right path into, into these three steps. So I look forward to hearing more from you and from everybody else. And I appreciate the time uh, letting me speak today. 
Thank you, Brian. So let's do uh, Cassandra up next, and then I'll bring my man Jonathan up. Good morning. Good Damn, morning. Good to see you. Um, you too. So, man, I don't, I don't even know what to say. I have so many thoughts in my head right now. Um, so I'll just do. I'll just lead in with an exercise. Uh, everybody, just pause for a second. Whatever you're doing. Cross your arms just naturally. Just do it real quick without even thinking. Cross your arms. Okay, now do the opposite arm. I say this quote all the time. 87% of entrepreneurs do not work within their zone of genius. They are following other tactics. I'm guilty of it. Everybody's guilty of it. And Sam, you just beautifully um, represented that. Can you hear me? My Wi-Fi is saying it's going out. It, it cut out for like a split second before, but it sounds good now. Can you hear me? Uh, maybe. It sounds like it's cutting out a bit now. Okay, let's let's do this. Let me let's go on to let me how do I do this? Can you let's go on to Jonathan. So Cassandra, I think the Wi-Fi was cut now a little bit too much near the end. We'll go on to uh, Jonathan, but uh, Cassandra, whenever you're ready, just raise your hand. We'll try it again. Hey, what's up, guys? Can you hear me? Oh uh, yes, we can. It's good to have you here, man. Awesome. Thanks, Sam. Uh, thanks for hosting the space. I apologize. I literally just jumped in right when you finished. You finished with a, a great line. Um, I was on another call, but I wanted to just hop in. I will definitely be listening to the recording, first of all, but I wanted to hop in and, and provide some value based on what I heard and from the title. Uh, and this is something that I've, I've literally never seen anybody talk about anywhere outside of sitting with Todd Brown one day. Um, I think it was like at a lunch table or something. But, you know, in the beginning of our journey, we all, we're all, we all learn sales, we all learn copywriting, we all know that we have to have products and create offers and all that kind of stuff, right? But then we see, at least you know, a few years ago, you would see a bunch of webinars. Um, you see people running Facebook ads to, like, let's say, a text sales page, a, a TSL. And some some people run VSL. Some people run challenges. Some people have communities. Some people do the, the you know this thing, that thing. And in terms of strategy and personality and linking the two together, um, in the beginning it can be hard to know what you should do. And you can try a bunch of different things, but maybe getting on YouTube and, and filming a bunch of videos or getting on a webinar or something really doesn't match with you and you can get better at it, but it will never match with you. It won't be your thing and you won't be able to, to go the distance. And that's what it takes is going the distance. So, uh, you know, what Todd mentioned to me that one day is basically that you need to find the vehicle that matches your personality that you can go the distance with. So for me, for example, I can, I can get up on stage and talk to people I can do a webinar and sell the crap out of whatever we're selling. I can do that, but I don't like to do that. And what I like to do is be behind the scenes. I like to, you know, if you like to write, if you like to actually, if you prefer text, be amazing at that. Become one of the best at that and sell your stuff, your, uh, your not only your sales vehicles, but even your product delivery. Make it through text. Andre Chaperon used to do that. Um, if you like VSLs, for example, I'm a VSL guy. That's just my mode. That's my thing. That's, that's what I like to uh, create and sell with. If that's your thing, then go that route. So anyway, I just wanted to hopefully provide a little bit of value of thinking about what sales vehicle and what I know, Sam, you were talking about business paths, right? But uh, this is a smaller piece of that, which is which, which way are you going to be able to make sales match the delivery vehicle with your personality and you'll be able to go a whole lot faster, a whole lot further, and you'll enjoy the process a lot more. Yes, man. It, great advice to listen to because uh, Jonathan's built something quite big. He's in the music niche, right? Because he loves music. Like it's quite as easy as that if we start to get rid of kind of all the noise and looking around at what other people are doing. For example, to what he said, a big conversation right now is video, right? Oh, should I start doing video? Should I start opening YouTube or doing Instagram reels? It's like, I mean, you could, but if you don't like video and you're not, video is not your thing, 
you can win just as a writer. You can keep winning just on X. There are people who are still winning with the same Instagram strategy from like 10 years ago. Everything works. Everything is still working. Even if it looks like it's not going to work anymore, everything is cyclical. Okay. It, it, it goes up, it goes down, but it never really goes away. I even know a guy who's getting back into the physical magazine industry. He's going to sell magazines that he sends to people's mail. I asked him about this. I was like, man, I always give an example of why that's a shrinking industry and you shouldn't get into it. Here you are getting into it. And he said, well, because I'm, I'm catering to CEOs. And what I've learned about rich people is they're willing to pay more if you give them less. They're willing to pay more to get rid of all of the noise and all of the bullshit they shouldn't pay attention to. I'm like, wow. Like, and that's just what he likes to do. Have something physical in his hands. So this is why it's so important to know who you are. Who you are is pretty much going to determine the business. It's almost like you don't choose the business. The business almost finds you. So I'll shut up a little bit. Let's go with uh, Marjorie and then we'll go Paul. Hey, everyone. So I'm so happy with this space. You have no idea because I feel like people don't talk about the stuff you just talked here. Uh, this platform is very skill based. And I think, you know, when we talk about personality, personality, we're just talking about like how to show your personality, but not how to integrate your personality into your business model or the contrary, actually make a business model that integrates into personality. And that's brilliant. And the reason I'm so happy is just because you were describing examples of people you know i mean the guy who just goes and hang out with people he wants to learn with it's amazing but the guy <laughs> who like his whole thing is to network and use his charisma i was like this is so fun i would love to get to do this uh, so my question is like of course these people they are in a moment in their lives where you know they are recognized for this and when you're starting out you're not there's probably a different path to get there. So I wonder if you're the next creator and you're doing your skill based thing here, whatever it is that you're talking about, how do you slowly evolve into a model where, you know, what you do for a business is more related to like dealing with people and that's working and et cetera, because I think that's one of my favorite things ever. And I would love to go towards that. Perfect. So here's um, Marjorie, you might be, you might know who I'm talking about. If not, I'll DM you later. And he'll have a lot of good advice for you. Here's how I did it, right? Is I started with a skill. And well, if I even backtrack even further, I realized kind of in the economy, in the market, this is going to sound harsh, but I was a little bit useless. I didn't have any skills at one point. Nobody wanted to hire me, rightfully so, because why would they? What value do I bring to them? I, I realized this early on and I said, okay, I need to become valuable. How do I do that? And I was like, oh, well, I could learn copywriting because apparently that's valuable for most businesses. So I learned copywriting and now people are starting to hire me. They don't care about Sam. They don't care about anything else other than the fact that this guy can provide something that the business needs. Most people stop there. They get hired uh, and they do the thing they're hired for. And then they just, you know, wander off or, you know, stop. They don't go above or beyond or anything. What I started to do is I started to kind of peek into their business. I started to be proactive and I started to see what other problems are these people dealing with. Okay. Because man, every business just has, I'm not going to say hundreds, but dozens of problems. And I started listening. I started looking and I started asking, Hey, what are you going to do about this problem? What are you going to do about that problem? And that's when I learned a lot of them don't have solutions to these things and they don't even have people to talk to. Like this game can be kind of lonely. And so I would just say, oh, like I'll talk to you about this problem and then we'll go back and forth. And then suddenly we come up with a good solution and I'm like, I'll also go implement it. I've never done it, but I'll try. And they're like, sure, go ahead and do it. They might pay me more, they might not. But if I do it right, I now solidify, solidify myself as a problem solver. So it's just this idea of whatever you get hired to do, you need to go one to two steps further, find a few more problems outside of your domain and then just start to talk with people on how to solve those. The last point I'll say to this is I have a buddy who is a marketer and he doesn't do anything online, nothing digital. He's one of these guys who works in quote unquote, like the real world. And I asked him, how do you do this? Cause he had just got off a call with like the former CFO of NASA. He was flying over to like Bangladesh to help this U S based company do their, you know, expansion, like crazy shit. 
And he said, all he does is he asks, he, he goes around, he networks and he says, Hey, how can I help you? What problems are you dealing with? And he comes up with solutions for them on the spot. And he says, we can work together on this or not. doesn't really matter. That's how he gets into these different rooms. So, um, it's definitely a networking game and it's a hundred percent related to being proactive about solving people's problems. Amazing answer. Thank you so much. Of course, of course. So, uh, Paul, we got you. Yeah, what's up? Hey, uh, Sam, I know from our DMs that we share uh, we share the love of a good Spanish woman and uh, the love of a cigar. So, uh, brilliant masterclass, man. Hey, um, oh, thank you. I, <laughs> I know one of your other main focuses is offers. You know, I get a lot of conversations with people not knowing how to leverage um, their skills into a business that, that gives them that freedom of time like you were talking about. Tactically, what, how, what kind of analysis or how do you work with people to look at their skill sets and then take these steps to implement that into a high leverage offer and then build a business around that? Oh, man, what a question. <clears throat> so as you said that stuff before, my girlfriend had just walked out, but she would have been uh, delighted to hear what you had said. Um, in terms of how I work with people to do that, it, I guess there's kind of two realms to this, which is I would take them through these same three steps that I do in terms of strategy. I would be asking them, what do you even want to do? Where are you currently? You know, uh, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses now? And then let's present different options, different like very tangible paths and let's choose one, right? So if I'm working with, uh, let's say, if I'm working with someone who doesn't really have a social media following, but they're a great writer, they're a great marketer, they just kind of need more, they need more leads. Well, we just work with what we have with them. So I, I don't really worry about building a big vision just yet. I just worry about getting them through the next step. Like let's just successfully take the next one to two to three steps and then once we get there, we can start to take more. So I'll have that person create a list of anyone in their network who they've ever done something for, ever worked with, who's ever they've ever left a good impression on. And then we'll create a word of mouth or referral strategy. We'll have them reach out to those 20 people with a custom message for each um, and a kind of sequence that leads into asking, hey, I'm doing this thing. If you know anyone, here's what it looks like. If you know anyone who needs help, uh, would love an introduction, right? So that's kind of strategically how we look at things. We, I just look at what are the skills you have? What are the assets and relationships we're sitting on? And then how can we combine the two? It looks very different and it's very creative for uh, people depending on who you are. But that's that's really step one, whether they're a beginner or I'm going into like some seven figure company, right? At the beginner level, we're testing and we're trying a lot of things and seeing what works. At the higher level, we're, we're actually trying to see what already worked and we're doubling down on that. So I do have a different lens depending on how big or small they are. Hey, that that's great. I okay. really appreciate the value bomb. That's awesome. I know. Your, the, your question it could probably be a space in and of itself, but uh, thanks for asking, man. Hey, there you go. Use that for your next one. Perfect. So let's see. We got uh, Fabio. Hey, Sam. Thank you very much for, for the opportunity. Um, all right. My question is related to um, the different segments that you said. If, like, if you're from zero to one, you can make a big mess. Uh, I see myself in this, in this segment right now. And I was wondering, like, how do you, how do you build on, on things that, that make sense to you and, and how do you pivot when um, like how do you know when to pivot or or if you should double down on something if you're not sure that that something is uh, fundamentally good like in the direction you're going or not does my question make sense oh it, it makes all the sense and it's actually with, with some of my more successful friends, this is like probably the number one question we all talk about because I don't know if you're there for the space, but I was talking about how billionaires deal with this problem too. Like the most successful people ask these questions, which is when do I know to double down or not? Um, 
this, I have a very offer focused perspective on this answer. I think I look at everything through the offer because that's kind of the gateway on how we make our money and what we build our business around. That's the point of exchange. So um, Fabio, let me ask you this real quick. Do you have an offer currently? I have an offer currently, but I've been me messing with it a lot because my offer is teaching people how to uh, negotiate better, how to learn to negotiate better. But I think that that's too broad, even though I come. Okay. And Sorry. what price point do you sell that at right now? Uh, I'm testing it out. Uh, uh, I'm at zero at this moment, but I'm trying to sell for 500 to to 1,000, 1K. <laughs> Amazing. So I'll, um, I won't go deep into the offer, but if you have an offer like that, what I typically look for is this, you're looking for a target. You want to, you want to be able to make that offer to anywhere from 10 to 20 people. Okay. What I mean by make that offer is whatever your pitch is, whatever your outline is, whether it's in a Google document or you say it over a sales call, you need to, you need to have 10 to 20 people hear it. You need to have 10 to 20 people see it. And they can't just be random people. They got to be people who want the thing that you have. Okay. So they got to be a qualified lead. And I say that because we got to keep ourselves honest. We can't just like tell our buddy that we got this new thing and count that as one. So 10 to 20 people, let's say we just give it to 10 people. I would want you to at least sell two of them. Okay. If you made this offer to 10 people and two of them bought, I would be happy. And I would be like, Oh, Fabio, you have something because what this means is if we were able to get two sales, and it's all very unoptimized and we're just messy and we don't really have like a plan for it yet. Imagine what we could do if we start to double down on it and start to create these systems, start to dial this in, start to refine the offer, right? So that's what I would look for. So after, And so it's not about so much of a time thing. It's the moment you make your offer to the 10th person, you look back and you say, did it make sales? If yes, was it easy? Um, was it fun? Was it hard? the answer to those questions is going to kind of tell you if you should just quit that offer and try something else or double down on it. Usually the result will fall in one of two buckets. It's like, sorry, one of three buckets. One, it falls flat. It doesn't work. It's fine to go move on to something else and test it out. Two, it kind of falls in this middle ground where it's like, yeah, you made some sales, but you had to yank and pull to make it happen. So it was kind of hard. So maybe you need to like, give yourself another 30 or 60 more days to see like, how does this unfold? Or three, you'll find that it hits. Like it's just a hit. People love it. You sold it very easy. Um, hopefully it falls into that bucket. And then once you have that feeling, you just double down on it. Thank you so much, Sam. This has been very enlightening. Of course. Of course. Thank you, Fabio. Let's go with Michael. Yo, yo, what's up? And and yeah, my mind is blown by this space. The oh, thing yeah. I'm, I, I'm, my question is, like, I see a lot of people and, and bigger creators give this advice that you need to solve one problem with your offer. But the thing that I'm thinking is like, the one problem can be much broader. I think many people say that you need to solve writing or like very specific problems, but I, I'm more of a generalist and I've done a lot of different stuff in life and I kind of have that problem solving mentality and and I don't even want to kind of narrow down too much. I, I just want to hear your thoughts about like these kind of broad problems. Of course, man. So I'm glad you asked this question because it's something that I have a strong opinion on that I've learned over time because I'm just like you. Even though I'm a copywriter, I'm a marketer, which is, uh, you know, people understand what problem generally that solves. I never focused in on one specific thing. So when I was asking what's the best offer, what's the best business, I realized I'm just going to go solve problems for people. So I've done so many different things for so many different people. If you look at a track record or a list of the projects I've done, they're all different. But the one, uh, the one commonality is they all worked and they helped that business at that time move closer to what they wanted. That is hard to package. That is hard to put in a bio of, a, of an X account. That is, it's, it's not too sexy either to say, oh, I'm a problem solver. That's not going to get people kind of drooling out of, you know, drooling, wanting to talk to you. It's a very deep strategic positioning. 
And to try and fit yourself into a box in terms of writing the best headline on your website or the bio on your X account, it's not going to work, right? To, to package yourself nicely, it's usually a little bit more tactical. It's like, oh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm the guy who helps grow X accounts or I'm the, the YouTube video guy, right? That is much easier. So in terms of being a problem solver, that is a fine thing to do because that's what I made my career on. You just got to understand there is a marketing channel for problem solvers. There is a positioning for problem solvers, which is don't try to put yourself in the box. If anything, make it a little bit more vague and mysterious on what you do on the outside. And your marketing channel is not so much a social media game. It is much more of a people will talk about you and spread rumors game. You should be hopping on calls, hearing people's problems, giving them little uh, bouts of insight because you don't need to be an expert at solving any one problem. What you need to do is have a system for identifying the right problems and then pointing someone in the right direction. That is going to make that will make you a lot of money because that made me a lot of money. It makes a lot of my friends a lot of money. Um, but you just have to kind of own that. You have to let people talk about you. They'll introduce you to other people and you just build a reputation for it. And as you know, building reputation takes some time. Oh, man, I love your answer. And, and, and actually, like the vehicle I'm using is flow state because that's what I'm. I'm a former pro snowboarder, so that's like the the whole thing that I I enjoy, and 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 the whole state makes your life better and everything. So that's kind of the vehicle I'm using. But yeah, uh, I'll I'll keep going. Thank you for the answer. Of hey, course, Sam, of can course. I, can I add something to that really quick? Where you? Do you mind? Oh, is that Jonathan? Jonathan, yeah. Is that okay? Of course, man. Sorry. Yeah. So Sam hit the nail on the head and one of the reasons i love sam so much is because he's a deep thinker strategic thinker and that's my wheelhouse i just i don't know why that gets my juices flowing but i love stuff like that so i'm pretty sure everybody has seen an umbrella before if you if you've seen a classic umbrella where you open the umbrella around the perimeter of the actual umbrella itself you have those little the ends of the the metal pieces the little um like the pins that stick out and there's like i don't know five uh eight or ten of them something like that like surrounding your head at the bottom of the perimeter of the umbrella but at the very top all of those lines connect to one point and there's always one point at the top of the umbrella so fabio i have the same problem that you have and it sounds like sam you have the same problem as well is that we have a lot of different skills like we can all do copy we can all create offers we can all drive traffic we can all we can do it all right and you don't want to pick just one thing so what i do is or the way I think about it is like the umbrella, all the points at the bottom of the umbrella, uh, not the handle, but the actual umbrella covering are different skills. But again, they all connect at one point at the top. So if you can figure out what that one point at the top is and put a name on it, something that's different that people haven't heard of, et cetera, that can be your thing. And that thing has to be connected with what Sam has been talking about in this whole space with your actual personality. You mentioned snowboarding and flow state, right? So this is going to be part of your, uh, your point at the top of the umbrella. What is going to be that thing where it's the embodiment of you and the, how do I say, the essence of how you deliver value that maybe not solves a particular problem because that might be copywriting or, or I don't know, video editing or something like that. But instead, it can be the result that you get for people or the, the, ben the main benefit that you provide for people. So I just wanted to add that part if it's helpful. Thank you a lot. Ooh, my, Michael's getting a master class today. I, um, <laughs> to, to add on to that, because now my brain's going. When I go into a business, uh, Michael, I think of this idea of all roads lead to Rome. So the problem can be expressed in so many different ways. That's where you can kind of win in terms of marketing yourself on social media. One problem can create like five or 10 different symptoms. And as we know, uh, most people point at a symptom and they say, oh, that's my problem. But we know that's not the actual problem. There's something underneath it. Think of like weeds rooting down into the ground, right? Most people are looking above the ground at the weed and saying the weed is the problem. They keep trying to cut the weed, but it grows back. We know as problem solvers, we need to go deeper. We need to look underneath the surface and we need to pull out the roots. So the roots, that's like what you are the best at. You're best at pulling the roots. What you need to find are the, the different ways the weed, like the roots start to grow into weeds above the surface. And that relates to Jonathan's thing. There might be eight different ways it expresses. 
you just start to talk about those eight things and say, those aren't your problems. The real problem is this deeper thing. If you go to my website and you click on the button that says book a consultation call, you don't need to go book one, but I have a document, a mini sales page that shows you how I pitch problem solving. The whole call is based on, I have this problem solving method that I learned from Warren Buffett and uh, Charlie Munger, which is inversion. And you can see how I talk about it, right? So uh, Michael, thank you. I believe we're going to go on to source. Hey, hey, Sam. It's always a pleasure to hear you speak, man. Um, actually, um, you guys kind of just answered my question. So I'll just, you know, I'll just uh, let the next speaker go. So thank you so much. Uh, you are a gentleman. I wanted to thank you for uh, requesting the cool free thing from the last space, man. It's been a pleasure to connect. And we will go back on to... We'll get to Cassandra uh, after Robin. So, Robin. Hey, Sam. So great to talk to you. Hey, you too. Thank you so much for everything, all the info you've already given me. You've helped me so much. And I'm just so excited that I discovered X in the past month. It's just been amazing. Um, so my question is, I have uh, two different problems that I want to solve for people. To what extent do you choose your problem based on what social platforms your client base hangs out on? Because the platforms for the uh, clients that I've been prepping this business for for months about to launch, I'm just not feeling as excited about those platforms. I'm more excited to hang out on X, which is where sort of my secondary client base is hanging out. So I don't know what to do. Yeah, it's so this is a tough one because it comes back to that word I always said, which was excitement, right? Mm -hmm. I don't believe anyone needs like so like any platform can work because and again, this is just my philosophy. Your ideal audience is on all of the platforms. You can get their attention on every platform. The person who spends their time on LinkedIn also spends their time on Facebook or they watch YouTube videos, right? Like it, it's all all these platforms just surround different audiences, but the context is different. So if you're not excited about a platform, you don't have to go to that platform. But here's where it gets tricky is because you are at the beginning stages of it. So looking at it, it's like, oh, that's, you know, that doesn't sound exciting. However, would you change your mind if you started that platform in 60 days from now, leads were leads and customers were just pouring in, right? Oh, what totally. I've learned is the the uh, the inclusion of like data and results can make something exciting. So when I joined X, I wasn't that excited because it was social media and I just have a track record of failing with building a personal brand. The, and I even almost gave up three months in because I just wasn't getting any traction. The moment I actually started growing and people actually started engaging, suddenly I now love X. So do you know what that would be for you? 100%. You totally answered my question. Thank you. Amazing. I Did you say you had another one or was that the one? No, nope, that was it. You just, you cleared my mind and that the word excitement was confusing me because I thought, well, gosh, maybe I shouldn't do the other one because I'm not excited, but that, that cleared it up. So thanks so much. Of course. Of course. So we have, uh, where is she at? Cassandra. Welcome back. Hi, <laughs> this is no, um, this is no dig on anybody. It doesn't live in the U.S., but I feel like I live in a third world country right now. I don't know how you suddenly lose Internet. But um, Sam, thank you again. I, I think I'm not sure what you previously heard, but it's just an exercise for um, something that really helped me kind of get into the embodiment of what you're talking about. Um, I, one of my mentors is Roger Hamilton, and I run everybody through the genius assessment and in the nest and or down on the right hand side, I, I put a photo in there so that it's a little bit more contextual as far as kind of what I'm, <clears throat> what I'm getting to. And I'd love your feedback. But there's there's a commitment to conduct. And the conduct is that for so long we've been programmed to like fit into these different business um, silos, niches, et cetera. And we have so much battery and so I'm sure everybody's taken these profile tests before, um, but an idea person is going to be very different than someone like Warren Buffett, who's about slowing things down and just sits and waits and crunches numbers and makes sure everything's methodically put into place. And so 
you know, the struggle, and maybe you can give some feedback on this, is <clears throat> being in your zone of genius, but also covering all the different areas of your business and the, the challenge of being a starting entrepreneur that's kind of in that infrared, not really making any money, but trying to make money. And then they start hopping into all the other different areas to run their business versus staying in their zone of genius and just just committing to conduct. And so that's kind of what you're you're talking about, you know, kind of being all over the place and just really doubling down on your genius. Uh, how do you support people in number one, determining that and then committing to the conduct? Got it. So that's that's so cool that you're in the Roger Roger Hamilton uh, world. I have completely forgotten about the wealth dynamics test, um, which is something that actually gave me a lot of clarity. I'm a, I'm a creator first, and what's the other one? Mechanic second. So I've definitely built a lot of my business around that. Oh my, um, you have my dream profile. I'm a creator and a dynamo, so I'm all about ideas. But. Oh, amazing. Basically, so, just wait, what that means, if he's a mechanic, guys, he can create the idea and then he has the left hand, which in season is winter and metal. So he can take those, break them down and, and create something out of complexity. That's why his brain works like this. Okay, back over to you. I'm learning something about myself today. The, uh, to your question is if I were to, so I'll try, I'll try to answer this the best I could, uh, based on what you said is when I, if I work with someone or I'm talking to them, it's like this beginning stage, they're going to have to wear a lot of hats because that's the game that's like, that's, that's this business game we play, right? We are taking a step out of the comfort of somebody paying us like a job. And to do that, Again, we can't just work one hour a day from the start. We might have to build the systems and the leverage to be able to do that. So maybe we're working five, eight hours a day at the beginning um, to build that leverage. So I have a kind of a, sometimes I have a harsh outlook on it, which is not everyone needs to be an entrepreneur. Not everyone needs to run a business. I'm not a hater of the nine to five. There's plenty of great nine to fives. I know a lot of people who are very happy in doing that, right? But um to start out, especially if we take stock of our resources and where you currently are, there are per certain people getting into this game. They're, they're kind of literally starting from scratch, no skills, no network. All they have is a hunger. I know this because that's where I started. And so those are the two things I usually work on is go find the skill that is valuable in the market and then go network with people who need that skill. Um, if we focus on that, if we focus on just that, it might be messy at first. You might be wearing a lot of hats, but it's okay. That's kind of what this game looks like. And the moment you kind of crack through that first level, you can then start to chip away at the things you don't want to do. Hiring the VA, um, you realize, oh, I didn't have to do this at all in the first place. So you just start, stop doing certain things. This is how I do it. I don't know if there's a better way. I do know if I were to take someone more advanced and let's say they do have a network per se, um, there are ways we can just skip through the stage where you don't have to do any bullshit, right? I've seen people launch businesses from scratch that hit, you know, $100,000 a month in the first 30 days. And that's like recurring stuff. They only were able to do that because they had an existing network. So that's my thought on uh, that first question. Cassandra, I don't, I don't even know if I tackled the, the core point of what you're asking, but hopefully that helps a little bit. <laughs> No, I think that's great. You know, just looking okay. at perspectives. And I'll just add one little piece on the, on the back end of that. We are such passionate individuals in this room. And I think my bigger point about sharing the wealth dynamics profiling, and I'm going to start doing some classes on this on X more so just some shares and some free assessments, but we carry so much shame. And the shame comes from we're not where we want to be. And at the same time, we're trying to, like you said, wear all these different hats. So if nothing else, know that you have a really incredible zone of genius. And that's just, that's just part of the game. That's playing the infinite game is figuring out how to pass that basketball to somebody else. So you can create that cycle of fruition of movement and consistent movement. So release the shame. You have a zone of genius. And um, I appreciate, I really appreciate your input and just know what season your business is in too, because so many of us as entrepreneurs want to play at the enterprise level. It's all these different tactics, but we're not at the enterprise level. 
having a high ticket for someone that's just starting off and then trying to sell it on X, we all know is a bad idea because we want to be something that we're not. So, yep, that's it. Appreciate you, bud. Love the way your mechanical brain and your creativeness works. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm done. Cassandra, thank you so much. Always a pleasure to have you up here. And I believe we'll go on to Kushi. Hopefully I said that right. Are you there? Kushi, you are up if you can hear me. Um, While that's coming, there is one other person who has requested, I don't know, profits and players. Yeah, there we go. Profits and players. Let's try that again. How are you? Hey, I'm doing good. Thank you. Oh, very good. I actually had a couple of questions. My first one, uh, just because I've been hearing some of the conversation involving Fabio and Michael, and then I hope Robin is still up here because I had a question uh, for her as well. And so I apologize that it's not directed towards you, but I've been listening and I had an interest in what they were talking about. Of course, go for it. So my first kind of question is it sounded like Fabio and and uh, maybe Michael, you guys were both selling uh, improvement services where, you know, you're, you're helping negotiation skills, you're helping closing skills. And so you're, in a sense, business to business in one way because they're running their own business as salespeople, right? And you're selling them a service that they're going to then use to convert into profit in their business right? So they're, you're selling a service that they can then apply in their own business and create a higher profit margin or a higher, higher line for themselves. Uh, so the first thing that I thought about was that one of the, the biggest characteristics of most decent, good, or just because of the culture, salesmen are hugely confident and many times overconfident. So you're telling me that I'm not good enough at my job and that I need your services but I've already been taught by my organization and my culture and my surrounding to overappreciate my abilities and to overestimate my skill set. And a lot of times when I see salesmen that are having a hard time, uh, yeah, some of them blame themselves, but most of them blame their surroundings. They blame the leads. They blame the management. They blame the coworkers. They blame the customers. And so, again, they're still not saying, I'm not good enough at this job. And so they're not realizing the need for your service yet. So they're not seeing why they need you in order to make their thing better. They're thinking they need better leads or better management or a new store or whatever else. So how is it that you're going to break through that barrier of false confidence to tell me that I need your service or how are you going to improve my profit margin whether or not I think I'm already good enough? It's a great question. Do you want to leave that as a, what do we call it, a rhetorical Absolutely could. So, uh, and then my second question for Robin is I actually um, sent you just a a comment on one of your posts and I would love to connect with you a little bit more. I have some satellite connection in my own life that actually could help, but I wanted to understand a little bit better. So I understand that you produce music and that you have um, those connections and especially relating music and branding or in that content relation. So you talked about your client and you said, well, this is more my secondary client versus my primary client. Um, who, who would you actually describe your client is and how is your service uh, overlaying? So obviously, you know, there's no music when I receive a flyer or when I receive certain advertisements. So how is your music integrating for that branding content or is it more just high corporate, you want your music applied to commercials, videos, and, and more things like that. So how, how would that kind of integrate? So um, thanks for the question. Um, my primary client uh, target right now is actually luxury wedding, uh, wedding couples uh, doing custom either musical monograms for them or uh, custom cover mashups that they can use during their ceremony. Um, the secondary client is just an idea that has come up uh, to target a little more uh, since I joined X, which is helping 
entrepreneurs do sonic branding for their small businesses, which would be uh, composing and producing short pieces of music that they could use as like, for example, a intro to a podcast, intro to a space, uh, use it in their uh, video posts, use it in their corporate videos, use it on their websites. And so my two, my two questions for you there would be uh, one, who are your current like brand ambassadors, for instance? So who's out there? Not you, because we all know that you're going to say your product's amazing. But what brands are out there saying, you guys need to get Robin. She's amazing. She's the one that produced this background number. I love it, and it's producing this result for me. Um, and then my second question is, what is the capital cost from start to finish for a finished product for you? So, you know, is it just time and labor and effort? Is there uh, an actual capital or, or retention cost? And the reason I would suggest that is find a couple of people in your ideal sector. So maybe it's that wedding thing. One of the things that you see a lot of artists doing nowadays, and it does, it costs them a, a certain degree of money, but the exposure that they gain from it very much outweighs that amount of money that they spent on doing it. So for instance, you'll see an artist fly to one of these weddings, surprise them, uh, play their wedding song for them live instead of having them play the recording of it. It costs the artist the time, it costs them the, the tickets and the flight and the money, but then that video has 10 million views, and now they've reached 10 million new people and said, look what my product does. And now they've got new clients and new revenue and new things coming in because I can guarantee you they may have had 500 people playing their wedding song before, but now I bet you they have a million people playing their wedding song uh, because they all watch that video and they want that um, connection that that person felt uh, through that social media video. This has been great. Profits and players, do you, uh, do you go by a name? Do you keep it anonymous? No, uh, my name is Daniel. And Daniel. Uh, okay. yeah, I appreciate it. But Daniel, thank you so much for the questions. I would say definitely connect with uh, Robin after this. Robin, thank you for uh, you know answering these and participating. Um, I'm going to take one more question and then I'll I'll uh, go ahead and end this space. I'm going to go with Hero. Hero, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah, Hero's perfect, man. Thank Hero, you. Perfect. Uh, Sam, I wanted to bring it all back to you. Um, you've talked about uh, the full stack entrepreneur, full stack creator. And, and you talked about today the three steps for the right business path. So I wanted to know more about your business path. What's your direction today? What is your current stage looking like? What's the next stage for you? And which are the challenges that you have ahead? That's all. Thank you. Oh, great question. Way to end this thing as well. So I have been going through stages as I'm... Uh, you know, the, the kind of the wisdom I share, it's things that I go through for myself. So my first stage was always just supporting other people. That was as a freelance marketer. Then I realized I wanted more leverage. What I found out is all of these personal brands and companies and influencers that would hire me, they all had a, a hidden shadowy business partner behind the scenes. The business partner was the one who was running the business. They were, you know, calling the shots and making the decisions. And I thought, huh, I could do that. And so that's when I started to go find these influencers, people who I would think are up and coming, and I would go strike business partnerships with them, usually on an equity basis, and I would be their behind the scenes guy. That way, I don't just work for the influencer and I get paid, you know, a small fee to do stuff for them. I can actually get paid on the upside. So instead of getting paid 5k a month, right, I could help take an influencer's business up to seven figures and get paid much more than that. That's the goal. And so that is the stage I'm currently at now. Um, it's why I've never, you know, it's, it's why I've been okay not building on social media for a while because I always felt like I didn't make a good face. I didn't make a good personal brand. Um, I didn't have these qualities that were super exciting or entertaining to follow. That was my experience. So I always just stayed hidden. It was this year when I realized I could do both. So I don't make my money by selling things to my audience. All I do here is I just share what I'm learning as my way of growing and creating. And where I make my money, where I do business is helping other people monetize their audiences. 
Now, that has always been partnering with someone and going very deep with their brand. So my former uh, partner, who we actually parted ways with recently, they were on Instagram. So their audience didn't even know who I was, right? We were just focused on that platform. Today, where it leaves me is I am deciding to take the uh, front-facing role. So where I used to go partner with other people and kind of build their brand and the machines behind it, I am going to partner with myself and do the same thing. I'm going to put myself on the front as the face, and I am going to be the guy who builds the machine, the marketing systems on the back end. You have caught me at a, a very interesting point in my life. That is a decision I've just made in the last few days. And so where that leads me is, one, it allows me to build stuff, which I love to do. But two, it allows me to keep creating, which is what you see here on Twitter spaces or on social media. Behind the scenes, I love connecting with people and I still love solving problems. So a big part of what I do every day is just networking, talking to people, seeing what's going on uh, and helping them solve problems. And I don't know what that's going to look like. I don't know where that leads me, but it always leads somewhere good. So I'm not attached to what direction that networking goes. Um, I'm just attached to kind of helping people solve these problems. So you may, you may see something from me, you know, by the end of December, you know, I've had people ask me, Hey man, when are you going to open up your own thing or start teaching this on a deeper level? I may, I may launch something. I may not, who knows? I got something bubbling up, but again, if I want to turn myself into my own case study, the idea would be monetizing my own brand, um, my own personal brand, growing it, monetizing it, and then showing people, Hey, here's how I did this. Uh, and then helping other people do the same. So that's kind of where I'm at at the moment. Love it, man. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, everybody, the questions were amazing. I want to thank you all for uh, anyone who came up and was a speaker. I'm going to wrap this up now. We are going to close down this Twitter space. Um, again, I just want to say thank you. Marjorie, Cassandra, Jonathan, Robin, Fabio, Michael, uh, Daniel, Kushi, I wish we could have talked to you. Hero, it's all been very great. And everyone else who tuned in and listened. Um, again, I'm just here to share something every week. Some of the stuff I'm learning and doing for myself. And I just want you guys to be the first ones to know about it. And I will uh, see you guys next week. Thank you so much for being here. Have a good rest of your weekend. Bye-bye.